Today, I want to get right involved in my message. I got a lot of ground to cover. I was on the clock on the first service. I did good, but I'm going to do real bad in this service. I'm going I'm to be a rebel. I'm going to preach till I get through. Is that okay? Yes. Amen. Amen. We've got to go home and get ready for this coming week. It's the 25th anniversary of the Brownsville Revival. Next, fa- next Sunday is Father's Day, and we're going to have a great week. Sammy Rodriguez is preaching for us on Thursday. I'm preaching on Friday. Michael Kulianis is preaching on Friday, and Jim Riley is preaching on Saturday. And then we're going to culminate Sunday with a really powerful Father's Day service. So if any of you want to come, I'd be happy to have you come. I, I want to leave something with you that the Lord himself gave me. This is not from a book. This is not a book report. It's something that I, I learned from the Holy Spirit. I'm going to explain it to you before I read it out of the Bible. I'm going to explain this passage of Scripture. When God told Moses about bringing the children of Israel into the land of promise. He said, Moses told the children of Israel, he said, you're going to get houses you didn't build. You're going to get wells you didn't dig, vineyards you didn't plant. It's an extremely good land. Matter of fact, when they sent the spies out, they came out with grapes, and the grapes were so big that they had them stretched across staves on men's shoulders bringing the grapes out. Exceedingly good land, just like God said. But Moses was not going to be the one to bring them into the land of promise. It would be Joshua. But while they were still in the wilderness, getting ready one day for them to occupy the enemy's land, God was going to drive the enemy out through Israel, and they were going to live in houses they didn't build. And God said, now Moses, when the children of Israel get in these houses, if I put green streaks on the wall and red streaks... It's a manifestation that I see something in that house that's not right. And there's going to be a way to deal with it of purification. And if it's mildew or if it's mold or if it's a fungus, you'll deal with it a certain way. But if it comes back, it's a fretting leprosy and it's spiritual in nature. So I'm going to read you the passage of Scripture now since I explained it to you a little bit. And I want you to look at it with me on the screen. The Lord spake to Moses and Aaron, saying, When you become into the land of Canaan, which I give you for possession, and I put the plague of leprosy in the house. God said, If if I put the plague of leprosy in the house of the land of your possession, he that owns the house shall come and tell the priest, said, You know, it seems to me there's a plague in my house. Then the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest goes in to see the plague, and all that's in the house be not made unclean. And afterwards, The priest shall go in to see the house, and he shall look on the plague. And if it's a plague in the walls of the house with hollow strakes, green or red, which in sight are a little bit lower than the wall, the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shall shut up the house seven days. And the priest shall come on the seventh day and shall look at it again. And behold, if the plague is spread in the walls of the house, the priest shall command that they... Take away the stones in which the plague is, and they shall cast them into an unclean place without the city. He shall cause the house to be scraped inside and out, and they shall pour out the dust that they scrape off outside the city, like in a a dump, a city dump. And they shall take other stones, put them in the place of those stones, shall take other mortar and replaster the house. If the plague comes again and breaks out in the house after they have taken away the stones and after they have scraped the house, and after it's been replastered, the priest will come and look. And if the plague is spread in the house again, it is a fretting leprosy. The house is unclean. They shall break down the house, <clears throat> and the stones of the house, and the timbers thereof, and the mortar of the house, and shall carry them forth out of the city in an unclean place. Now, when the people of Jericho and other, there was ten cities that Israel was going to have to take. And when they, in Jericho, it was a fortified city, and when they knew that the Jews were on the other side of the Jordan ready to come in, the people's hearts were terrified, according to Rahab. All the men's hearts were terrified because they had heard how that God was with Israel, and they knew that they were coming in to take their homes, and they knew that they were coming in to possess the land of promise that God promised Abraham. So they began 
they said, well, they may get vineyards. We didn't, they, they didn't plant. They may get our houses, but they're not going to get our silver and gold. So they would melt their silver and gold down into little demon gods that they worshiped. Like if you look at a 50 cent piece, there's a Kennedy on the 50 cent piece, many of the 50 cent pieces. A, a quarter has Washington on it. Pennies have Lincoln on it. Well, they melted their gold and silver down. And they put the images of their false gods and then they would hide them in the walls of the house and hide them under the house. And they would say, we're going to fix it where the Jews can't get to our silver and gold. So God said to Israel, he said, when you get in the land of promise now, and I see something is in that house that's not going to go well with you. I want you to fare good. And if I see something in that house that's going to keep you from faring good and doing good, he said, I'm going to put green streaks and red streaks on the wall, some of them a little bit lower than the wall. And he said, the priest will come in, look at it, may even command that they take the stones apart, scrape them, replaster it, put them back. But if he comes back again, tear the house down, it's a spiritual malady. It's a spiritual problem. It's not a fungus. It's not a mildew. So they would tear down the house, and when they'd tear down the house, they'd find those demon gods. Number one, the first thing I'd like to talk about is God knows that atmospheres affect us greatly. Now, when I talk about atmospheres, I want you to understand this is something that the Holy Spirit taught me. This is not something I figured out. The Holy Spirit really taught me this, and I learned it through revival, and I'll tell you how I learned it in just a few minutes. But God knows that atmospheres affect us greatly. God told Moses and Aaron before they ever entered into Jericho, if I put that sign in the house, something is there that's going to affect the Jews. And an atmosphere can affect your well-being. An atmosphere can affect your sleep patterns. It can affect how lightly you sleep or how deep you, deeply you sleep. It can affect how well your food digests. It can affect how your meal is eaten and what circumstances it's eaten under and how it digests in the body. It affects relationships between husbands and wives. When the atmosphere in a home is not right and the atmosphere is a sterile atmosphere and spirits get involved in that kind of a sterile atmosphere, Somebody can say something out of their mouth in a positive way, but by the time it reaches the ear of the hearer, the message has been garbled. And when it reaches the ear, it makes her flaming mad, although he didn't mean it. From the time he spoke it till the time she received it, the message was garbled, and it's a bad communication. It's a, spy, it's a spirit of strife. It's a spirit of strife. Sometime they may mean it, sometime they may not mean it, but by the time it reaches the ear of the hearer, the message has been garbled. When things are not right in a church, a pastor can get up, he studied, prayed, fasted, sought God, put hours into a sermon, and by the time he stands up to preach it, if the atmosphere is not right, it goes out of his mouth and falls within feet on the carpet, and it never penetrated the hearts and the ears of the hearers because it's been fought. It's been distracted. It's been delayed. And many times when a preacher gets up and preaches, his heart is right, and he's saying things to try to help people, but many people get up and stomp out, and they don't like what he said because by the time it reached them, a spirit had taken his wonderful message, and when it hit the he ears of the hearers, the atmosphere had garbled the message, and it made them mad. It's an atmospheric thing. According to the Moses, he said, I'm going to put these manifestations in the house of these green streaks and red streaks, and they shall break down the house. It says in Leviticus 14, they shall break down the house, the stones out of it, the timber and the mortar, and shall carry them forth outside the city. They would dismantle the house, and then they would find what God knew was there all along. I have a question. If God saw what was in those homes. And that's the reason he told Moses, he said, tell them before they ever get there. You won't be with them when they get there. But now I want to tell you to go ahead and teach them now while they're in the wilderness. When, I, when they see the green streaks and red streaks, 
and I put that manifestation in the house, it's because I see something and it's going to affect my people. It's going to affect their rest. When the atmosphere is not right, it affects your prayer, your prayer life. When the atmosphere is not right, it affects how husbands and wives communicate or don't communicate. It affects how parents communicate with their children, children with the parents. It affects how people in the church communicate when something's not right. And atmospheres are terribly important. Jesus, before he would go in, and, and when he got ready to go into the temple finally to make his debut, he made a whip. And he went in, and the Bible calls it cleansing the temple, but basically he was cleansing the atmosphere. They were buying and selling in the church. And he said, my house should be known as a house of prayer among all nations, but you've made it a den of thieves. What they were doing had defiled the atmosphere, and it kept the presence of the Lord from touching the people and moving and ministering to the people. When Jesus would go in certain homes, like in Jairus' home, he would go in and Jairus' daughter was ill. And when he went in there, when he, got, when he got to the house, Jairus was with him. And when Jesus walked in, there were people out in the yard, you know, professional mourners, and they were crying, oh, it's just horrible. And Jesus said, what are you guys crying about? Oh, she's dead. He says, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. And the Bible said they laughed him to scorn. I've seen that religious spirit in church before. Oh, Brother Kilpatrick. Oh, Brother and you say something they don't like, and they'll cut your throat. The Lord knows about those religious spirits. He didn't want those religious spirits in the house with him when he's about to do his miracles. Could I say something to you? It's time for our churches to get rid of the religious spirit and let the Holy Spirit begin to do what the Holy Spirit does. Amen? And the Bible says, and I love this, the Bible says, and when he had cleared the house of all those people, Jesus went in and he spoke to her and he brought her back from that death sleep. Had to get the atmosphere right, but in order to get the atmosphere right, he had to deal with some things that was clogging and messing the atmosphere up. He had to purge it out first because God moves in circuits. His spirit moves in circuits and he doesn't want those circuits disturbed. He wants his presence to move there. The second thing I would like to talk about is Atmospheres attract spirits. Atmospheres attract spirits. The Jews were God's covenant people, but they were under the influence of an atmosphere that would make their life miserable and cause them to experience failure, and God wanted them to experience success. And I want to just take a minute and talk about this. Atmospheres is something that you have to concentrate on. In a grocery store, you'll see the stock people go in the grocery stores after hours and they're stocking the shelves. Atmospheres of churches and atmospheres of homes are much the same. You have to learn to stock the atmosphere. You have to learn to stock the atmosphere in a church. It has to be stocked. We prayed two and a half years at Brownsville, and we had to stock the atmosphere. We had to stock the shelves. And so when revival broke out, we prayed two and a half years, but we reaped a five-year revival. We prayed two and a half years, but we reaped a five-year revival. And in prayer, we didn't really realize it. We were praying for ourselves. We were praying for other people. But my wife always headed up the revival banner. And so we would be stalking, and we didn't even realize what we were doing then. I didn't understand it then, but we were stalking the shelves because soon the world was going to be coming to Brownsville and they were going to have great needs. Many, were, many had demons and needed to have the demons expelled from them. Many were going to be sick and afflicted. Many was going to be called to the ministry. Many was going to be bound by all kinds of addictions. 
And so we didn't realize what we were doing, but we were stocking the shelves. So when revival broke out, I couldn't stop what had happened, you know, because when revival broke out, we prayed two and a half years, but if you stop the prayer, so we, we chose Tuesday night as continuing not to have revival service that night, but to continue the prayer meeting. And we prayed, and many nights there'd be thousands of people there on Tuesday nights, 3,500, 3,000 people, sometimes more, sometimes a little bit less. Thousands of people would come. Even people would come for the prayer meeting as much as they would the revival. And the Lord was showing me how to stock the shelves. He was showing me how to stock the atmosphere, stocking it. It's spiritual. Just as words are spirit and life, there's other things that we have to stock the shelves with. So when people come, the atmosphere has been stocked and there's things for people when they come. You've got to prepare for it. It's spiritual, it's invisible, but oh my God, is it real. And so, as people begin to come and we continue the prayer, you might say, well, why don't you, why don't you just, with people coming from all over the world, why don't you just do away with prayer on Tuesday night and have a revival service? Because prayer is what started the revival and prayer is what perpetuated the revival. It started it and it perpetuated it. And um, many people would come in, they would be delivered of dem demons. Many people would be delivered of vices, drugs, alcohol, pornography. Many people would be saved. In the first few months, we had 350,000 salvations in the first few months. People from all over the world. And um, when people meet God like that at the altar and they get delivered, the things they get delivered from remains. It doesn't just disappear. And so the prayer meeting was to purge the atmosphere every week of all the major things that had happened during the revival and to purge the atmosphere and get it cleansed again and get it ready for the circuits of God to move through those circuits again. You don't want to leave a spirit of pedophile in the church. You don't want to leave a spirit of fear in the church. You don't want to leave a spirit of pornography there. And all these kinds of things. I'm calling them spirits. Some of them are, some of them are not, but I'm just talking in general. But you don't want to leave those things there. And so we would open the doors and the ushers would come and my staff would come and my pastoral staff would come. We'd lock arms and people by the thousands would see it and they would participate too. They'd lock arms. We'd open the doors and we'd drive those things out. Out! Out! You cannot remain here. Out! And we would begin to ask God to fertilize the atmosphere for the next incoming week. Atmospheres are two kinds, sterile and fertile. You walk in a home where the atmosphere is sterile, nobody has to tell you it's sterile. It's cold. Nobody really wants to be there, including the kids. You walk into a church where an atmosphere is sterile, for whatever reason it's sterile, church trouble, church division, church splits, sin, whatever it may be, it's sterile. People come walking through the doors. They're searching for a church. Immediately they feel that sterile atmosphere and they may suffer through the service, but they've made up their mind already in the first few minutes, I'm not coming back here. This place doesn't feel good to me. It doesn't matter the bigness of the church. It doesn't matter what size the church is. It doesn't matter the complexion of the church, what the church is made up of. If the Spirit of the Lord is there, there's peace there. And there's miracles and signs and wonders there. But you can have everything looking good on the outside. You can have everything looking fantastic. Everything can look greatly successful. But when people walk in the door, they know this is either a fertile atmosphere or this is a sterile atmosphere. And the one thing you want to do is you want to have a fertile atmosphere in your church where when people come in, they feel surrounded by the love of God and by the love of other people. They can receive. And it changes the way they feel. I'll tell you what I learned. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Let, let, me, let me cover this real quickly before I leave it. I learned, I need a water please. I learned that an atmosphere 
has to be sustained. You have to sustain an atmosphere. Thank you very much. What do I mean by sustaining an atmosphere? You can have a really good service on Sunday. And out of 52 Sundays a year, you may have three or four really good services where people are crying at the altars, people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, people get saved, worship is just free, everybody leaves talking about, oh my God, wasn't church great Sunday? It's true, but those kind of services are usually not the normal, they're a fluke. They're an aberration. They usually are something that just happens occasionally. What the Holy Spirit was beginning to show me is you have to learn to take an atmosphere to sustain that atmosphere, to sustain it. You don't want aberration. You want to sustain it. When you have a powerful service, go back and see what made the service powerful. It's like I told the church this morning, one of the things I learned about atmospheres is in almost every service, there is a, there is a moving of the Lord or moving of the Holy Spirit, however you want to put it, where the Lord comes in and the service is going on, everything's going good, but all of a sudden a tiny opening opens in the church service. And it may be just something about that size. Just a slight opening. And it's like the Holy Spirit says, John, I'm over here. And you're the one in charge. And you're ready to preach. You've studied, you've prepared, you've prayed. And it's like the Holy Spirit says, John, I'm over here. And all of a sudden, somebody over here starts crying or weeping out loud. One of the tendencies of most of us in the ministry is the tendency is to disregard that and move on so we can preach our message. But many times the Holy Spirit's trying to get in the service so he can take over and touch the people. You see, we can get so accustomed to the preacher doing everything that we won't let the Holy Spirit do hardly anything. And so whenever he's trying to move, and maybe there's somebody there that's got a, a habit that's had them bound for 40 years, and God really wants to touch them. Yes, he can touch them when the word is being preached. But he also can touch them when we lay hands on them and pray over them. And a lot of times people come to church hoping that God is going to invade the service and start moving in the service. And maybe we're going to have a powerful service today. I don't know about you, but if I go to church, I'm always going wondering, Lord, what are you going to do today? I'm tired of predictable church. I want God to show up and do what only God can do. Come on, give him praise. I believe this. I believe that there's people that go to church every Sunday. They're not dissatisfied. They're not against their pastor. They love him. They're not against the worship leader. They love him or her. They're not against the youth program. They love it. They love the children's program. They love it. But they leave out of church so many times they're not dissatisfied. They're unsatisfied. And there's a difference. You're not dissatisfied with the church. You're not critical of the church. But you leave out hoping that God would do something. Hoping that the power of God would move. Hoping that you could feel something in the service. But they leave out every time and it's like there's nothing there. Oh, I believe we're entering into days right now when God is about to move like we haven't seen God move possibly in our lifetime. Come on, give God praise. Woo! And people want God to move. They want to feel his presence. They want to feel his touch. So here's what happened. At Brownsville, I was the pastor there 13 years before revival broke out. I went there in 82 and revival didn't break out till 95. So I was there 13 years. I knew everybody by their first name. I knew their children by the first name. I dedicated them. When I went to Brownsville in 82, it was running a little bit less than 300 people. By the time revival broke out, it was running about 1,800 people. 
That's not a ginormous church, but it was, it, the church was strong. It was good. They loved me and I loved them. <clears throat> I had counseled people that had been through divorce while I was pastoring there. I had also counseled people that I knew was going through divorce. I had counseled people that was having trouble out of their youth. You started drinking and running with the wrong crowd and different things. And I knew the problem that the parents were having with some of the youth. So I knew what was going on in the church when revival broke out. But when revival broke out on Father's Day of 95, the strange thing was, it was a um, powerful eruption. It was not church as usual. It was mega presence and mega power. It beat anything I've ever seen. And I've been in Pentecost all my life. And it was happening in the church where I pastored. And I was almost undone where I couldn't hardly function as the pastor. The power was so strong. It was glorious. And so, before the world started coming to Brownsville, then we had about two weeks, I guess, where the Holy Spirit would move and touch and we're touching Brownsville, the congregation of Brownsville, before the world started coming. So there were people in the church there that was really being powerfully touched and powerfully ministered to. So <laughs> I began to see people. Church would go on all night long. Me and Steve would say goodbye to each other after sunup the next morning. The power of God would be so strong in church. It was just glorious. There was no highfalutin biggity, uppity, nothing like that. It was just such an atmosphere of freedom in the Holy Spirit. It was glorious. It, was, it had an order, but it also had a disorder. We kept it in the margins of sound doctrine. That was my job. But to see that and to see God touch these people, I'd see couples that was headed to divorce court and they was laying on the floor Two, three o'clock in the morning, hugging and crying, tears running down their faces. Their kids was hugging mom and daddy and crying. Some of them standing over in the corner, hugging and crying. And they were loving on each other. And I knew they were, some of them already just got divorced and some were headed for a divorce. Now they're crying and hugging each other. And I'm saying to myself, wow, Jesus, look at this. This is revival. A man couldn't do anything like this. This is the Holy Spirit. And then if I saw, if I heard from one family that God was touching and when they was in church and it's so powerful, I heard from, I would say, safely scores of families, scores of them. And so I began to hear from people that said, well, Brother Kilpatrick, we're in church and we feel the presence of God so strong. We just feel so happy. We're hugging. We're making up. We're reconciling. And the kids are crying. And it's just, pastor's just wonderful. We love what's going on in church. But when we go home from church, before our tires hit the carport, the garage, and the, and the door goes down behind our car, we're fighting and fussing like cats and dogs. And if I heard that from one People, one person, I heard it from scores over a period of weeks. So finally, I, I heard it so much, I went before the Lord one day in prayer. And I said, Lord, what, what's going on here at church? At church, everything's great. Well, they get home. And here's what the Holy Spirit said to me, and this is where this message came from. Holy Spirit said to me, he said, when they come to church, the atmosphere has been purged over two and a half years. People have prayed. People have evicted and purged the atmosphere of everything that hinders revival. And they have prayed. They have anointed. They have blessed. People have moved around and they've opened the doors and they prayed. And the places, the atmosphere has been changed and the atmosphere has been swept and garnished. And he said, so when they're there, their personality changes. They're happy. They're fulfilled. They're ready to make peace. They're ready to talk. Reconciliation. They're ready to forgive. He said, but when they get home, and by the time they get out of their car doors and they're headed in the house, 
they come back under the influence of another atmosphere that hadn't been purged. All those curse words are still in the atmosphere. All those pornography things are still in the atmosphere. And the arguments, the accusations, the misunderstandings, the passion of making themselves known, I don't like this. And as soon as they come under that atmosphere that hadn't been purged, their personality changes. They hadn't done anything different since they left church. But when they were in that atmosphere, it was glorious and wonderful and everything was green lights. They get home and everything is, they want to divorce again. They're, they've been threatening divorce in five minutes. I knew this wouldn't last. And so I said, Holy Spirit, what's going on here? He said, tell them if they will purge the atmospheres in their homes and repent to each other and pray and evict those things out of their house. I'm not talking about demons necessarily. I'm talking about influences that's inventoried themselves in their homes. Evil influences, evil things that's happened there has inventoried itself in that atmosphere. The Lord said if they'll get that out and ask for forgiveness. One of the reasons why the Bible says don't let the sun go down in your wrath is because when people have a big argument at home, a man and his wife, and they're in the bed, and he's really blessed her out, and she's responded, she's blessed him out. She slides over on her side of the bed. He slides over on his side of the bed. Don't you touch me. Y'all ever done that before? That's why you're laughing. I understand. But you know, the Bible says, don't let the sun go down in your wrath, because if you let that stay in your house, and you don't ask for forgiveness and make things right before you go to sleep, those spirits begin to move around in your house. And tomorrow morning when you wake up, things are not better, things are worse. You have to learn to close doors on things like that. Shut the door to it. No. If a GD comes over the airwaves in your home and you're watching television, it's GD this and GD that, SOB, MF, and those words come in your house, the Bible says that the word of the Lord is spirit and life and the words of the devil is spirit and death. You let a good GD come in your house. If you don't shut the TV off right then, open up the door and plead the blood and say, out, out. You can't stay here, out now. You'll find out that damnation will start breaking out all over your house. Did you realize <laughs> that in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Sodomites never got in Lot's house. The angels were there, and the angels were stalwart men. When the Sodomites surrounded Lot's house, they wanted those angels, strange flesh. Lot went outside and called them brethren. He said, no, 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 you can't, let's not do this, brethren. Let me give you my daughter's. And the angels came outside eventually and had to just push Lot back in the house and they blinded those Sodomites and they staggered off in the darkness. The Sodomites never got in Lot's house. <clears throat> but I want to tell you today, you might get mad at me when I say this, but I just want you to hear me. Because I care more about you and I care more about the presence of God in your home than I do you getting mad with me. I'm just trying to be honest with you. But your 50-inch television, your 75-inch television, your 100-inch television is technology that has the very same effect as a portal opening up and closing. And it becomes a landing strip. And those spirits come right in your house just like a landing strip of an airport. They land in your den. They land in your living room. The GD's with it the F word with it, the nudity, the homosexuality, the lesbianism, lands right in your house. It's like a portal opens up and you watch it and probably even try to get some sexual gratification from it. 
And then after you've got your sexual gratification, whether it's your teenagers or whether it's your husband or whether it's you or as a woman or whatever, you shut the TV off and you didn't repent. And when you shut the TV off, that landing strip stays open and those demons stay in your house. And they rumble around and they visit the bedroom of your son. They visit the bedroom of your daughter. You say, I don't believe you. You might not believe me, but just entertain what I'm telling you. I care enough about you to tell you the truth. I'm trying to tell you the truth. Those kinds of things does not go well with the moving of the Holy Spirit in revival. When revival comes, those things have to be under the blood. The church has to be purged. The home has to be purged. If you're going to have revival, continue. Somebody say, well, Brother Kilpatrick, will it send me to hell? I'm not going to go there with you. I will say this. It'll certainly steal your anointing. And it'll certainly rob your home of the peace that everybody needs when they're home. Atmospheres. An atmosphere over a period of time will develop into a climate. And that climate, if it's sustained over a period of time, will draw a culture. So, what happened at Brownsville? We prayed two and a half years. And as we began to pray, and we prayed around those 12 banners. The revival was one of them. My wife headed up the revival banner. We prayed two and a half years, and we prayed hours every week around these banners. It began to change the atmosphere of the church. Now we're beginning to have powerful services on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. We're sustaining that atmosphere through prayer. It's sustaining. Then, it's like in Alabama where I live. I live on the coast, right near Gulf Shores. Same thing like Pensacola. That's a hot atmosphere. South Alabama, right on the Gulf. That climate draws sunbathers. A lot of suntan lotions sold. A lot of boats are sold there. A lot of fishing, fishing charters. Sunbathers come, people that love the sun. They make plans to go there on vacation. They make plans in December because they know by June, July, and August... This atmosphere has been sustained long enough. It's created a climate, and that climate draws the culture. Same thing true in Breckenridge, Colorado. Cold, you can depend on it. Buy your skis, make your reservations. We're going there in November, December, January. Because that atmosphere has been sustained long enough, it's a climate, and the climate draws the culture. When a climate in a church has been changed and revolutionized and now the Holy Spirit's beginning to move and people are beginning to be saved and people's beginning to have a love in their heart for sinners and they want to see people be saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and delivered, then the climate is heralded. People hear about Brownsville. They hear about this. They hear about that church. They hear about Houston. And it draws a culture. It draws a revival-type-minded culture. People that wants to get in on the move of God. And I believe before Jesus comes, there's going to be so many of these type places all over the world. Not just in America, but all over the world. Where God is going to begin to move. And the atmosphere is going to change from being dead, cold, dry religion. And a religious spirit is going to change. And it's going to be a moving of the Holy Spirit. And it's going to be sustained long enough, it'll create a climate, and that climate will draw a culture. And listen, one thing I learned when revival broke out at Brownsville, when God began to move, it began to draw people from all over the world. They began to move to Pensacola. Why did they move to Pensacola? Because when they walked through the doors back there, there was nothing special about that place at all. Nothing special about Brownsville. Nothing for sure special about me. Nothing special about Pensacola, but when they came in the back door, they felt that atmosphere of the glory of God. And without advertisement, it went around the world and people began to move to Pensacola. 
And I'm telling you, it can happen in Houston. Let's change the atmosphere of our churches. Come on, give God praise. Woo! I've got to hurry. Was that good or bad? Is that good? Okay. Let me give you one scripture here that's, that this, this, this really blows me away. When I first saw this, I had preached on this scripture for so many years, but whenever I saw this, I never preached on it the same since. And everything I'm giving you, friend, I'm not smart enough to figure this out. This is something the Holy Spirit showed me. It's not that I'm brilliant or anything like that, because I'm not. But I'm going to set this up for you. Jesus got kicked out of the temple. So he couldn't preach in the temple anymore. So he had 12 disciples, but he also had 70. And the Bible said that he called the 70 to him and he said, I'm going to send y'all out two by two, which means 35 teams. 35 times two is, I am brilliant. Amen. <laughs> so 35 teams of twos and the Bible said that he was going to send them out to every place where he himself was going to come. So he couldn't preach in the temple anymore. He's got to go to people's homes. And I want to show you something that's so powerful. Whenever I saw this, I thought, my God, Lord, you're showing this, aren't you? You're, you're revealing this. Look at it. It says, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also, and he sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was going to come. And let me ask you a question. Can't you imagine somebody coming up and saying, hey, Jesus wants to come to your house for a service? Well, I don't know. You know, if somebody said that to my wife, she'd start cleaning right that moment. <laughs> Amen. Can you imagine Jesus coming to your house for a service? Now watch this. It said, he sent them out two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. He said unto them, the harvest is great, the labors are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he'd send forth labors into his harvest. He said, go your way, I send you forth as lamb among the Don't carry purse, nor script, nor shoes, nor salute no man by the way. But now verse five is the clincher. Jesus said to these disciples, he's 70, he's sending out by twos. He said, whatever house you enter, now, look this way just for a minute. Take it off the screen for a second. He's saying, whatever house you enter makes no difference their stratus, their income, color of their skin, makes no difference about none of that stuff. He said, the litmus is this. Whatever house you enter into, put it back up. First say, peace be to this house. In other words, while you're still on the porch, before you enter into the house, the litmus test is this. Peace be to this house! And he said, if the son of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But he said, if the, peace, if the son of peace is not there, it will return back to you again. Now look this way, please, everybody. Take it off the screen. Look this way, please. He said, when you say, peace be to this house, he said, if your peace, if the son of peace is there, when you give that word, it'll settle in and everything is a go. You can bring me there. But he said, if you say, peace be to this house, and the son of peace is not there and it flies back in your face, what he was saying is, don't bring me to a place where my presence is not going to be welcome. Don't bring me to a place where my giftings and where my power is going to be hindered. Bring me to a place. And it's just like I said, when Jesus would go in to do miracles, he would get the wrong people out of the room because his presence flows in peace. The anointing flows in relaxation and peace. The Lord walks through the wall. First thing he says to everybody, and he needs to say it to me for sure. <laughs> He walks through the wall. Peace be still. I, 
I'd be running down the street, I believe, if I saw something like that. But, you know, he, he has to speak peace. And what he was saying is, don't bring me into the wrong houses because he said, if you bring me into the wrong place, I can't do my miracles. And look at the next verse. He said, if the peace settles in, he said, heal the sick that are there and say to them, the kingdom has come nigh unto you. Could it be? Could it be? Just asking. That may be one of the reasons why we don't see more healings in our homes and in our churches is because the Spirit of the Lord isn't there like it should be. Maybe the Spirit of peace isn't there like it should be. I'm not preaching to you that all systems have to be go for God to do anything. But I'm saying if God's going to do what he wants to do, the atmosphere has to be right. And I will say this to you. If you want rest and you want peace and you want a place where your prayers can be heard without being hindered and you want good communication between husband and wife and parents and children, if you want your food to digest right, you're going to have to work on the atmosphere. And there's some things that may need to be purged. I'm certainly not going to be the one to tell you what to purge. But I'm just telling you, everything I've given you today is scriptural. So, in closing, as I close out the service, I want to tell you what happened to me I was invited up to preach in Appalachia. And um, I was going to a little church up in the mountains. I'd been sitting in the audience with my Bible, and I was waiting on the preacher to introduce me. The place was packed out with people. The windows were raised in the church. There's people out in the parking lot hanging inside the windows. They, so many people, you, you couldn't hardly move. There's so many people there. They'd heard about Brownsville, and they knew I were there, and I was going to be talking about revival, so they were interested, and they came. So I was just sitting out in the audience. I got there a tad late, and I'm just sitting in the audience. And, you know, I've been listening to some of the worship, and it was good, and I was just sort of thinking about what I was going to say, you know, and how I was going to get started. And all of a sudden, I had something happen to me. I never had it happen to me before, and it's never happened to me since. But all of a sudden, I began to feel like, I stayed in the building, but I, I began to hear what I was not hearing in the house, I was hearing outside the house. Now, that's a hard way to describe it, but it, that's the way it was. That's what happened. And I began to hear in those mountains up there, in those Cumberland Mountains, I began to hear people, the voices of old women, Jesus, don't forget us, Lord. Don't forget us. I know you're pouring out your spirit in Arkansas, and I know you're pouring out your spirit in different places in Azusa, Lord, but don't forget us. Don't forget our babies. Don't forget us, Lord. We love you, and we need revival, Lord. Please don't forget us. And I began to hear the voices of older men. You could hear the voices cracking. Oh, God. Oh, Lord, we pray, and we ask you to send your spirit here. We love you, Lord, and we need you so bad, Lord. Our family needs you. Our city needs you. Our country needs you. Lord, please don't forget us. And I'm telling you, it pulled on me. I, I don't know why the Lord let me hear it, but it, somehow it, it happened to me. It pulled on me. It moved me. And the next thing I heard was, I heard the preacher saying, and now here he is, Pastor, uh, Pastor John Kilpatrick from Pensacola Revival. He's coming. Well, when I got up, I didn't have time to gather myself. I wanted to cry. I stood up behind the podium and I said, oh my God. I said, I just had an experience and I must tell you about it. I said, I heard on the outside of this building, 
the voices of old people, older people. Sounds like grandpas and grandmas, mothers and dads. I heard him saying, Lord, please don't forget us. Don't forget our babies, Lord. We want revival too. Please don't forget us. And man, when I said that, there were people fell out of their seats into the floor wailing. And I heard one say, that was my daddy. And another one said, that was my grandfather. That was my mother. That's what my mother and them used to walk. Well, all we had was a brush harbor. This is the first church we've ever had. All we've ever had up here has been a brush harbor and tents. And my grandfather and my mother would walk around outside with bro bim overalls on and, 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 and brogan boots and they'd have shawls and little sweaters pulled over them. I spewed up out of the ground and didn't even have a church, no heat or anything. And they'd be walking around in these hills praying. And what the Lord let me hear was those prayers were inventoried in those hills. And God wanted me to know that those prayers are still there and that he heard those prayers and he's going to answer those prayers. And it also let me, go ahead. It also let me know that there's prayers across America that's been prayed by prophets and preachers and prophetesses and men of God and women of God and prayer warriors and intercessors and those prayers are still out there. God has for not forgotten those prayers. <laughs> Go into the Supreme Court of the United States. Look up on the wall what's written there. The Ten Commandments. Words of Moses. Statements all up there engraved in tablets all over America. Churches that no longer exist. Moms and dads that's in the grave. Now those prayers are inventoried. And what the Lord said to me was, he said, I hear every one of those prayers and I have them bottled up. They're inventoried and I'm about to pour out my spirit in these last days. I... Go ahead. Ha, ha, ha.